Good morning again. Hey guys. <laughs> Hi y'all. Uh, it is so wonderful to be here with you all today. So many friendly faces out in the crowd and so I appreciate that. Hi Thomas. Uh, if, you ha if we haven't met yet, I am Kristen Steed, as Haley has introduced me. I am our adult ministry coordinator here. I'm on the team with Re Reverend Reagan Gilland. I will be very excited when she is back from maternity leave. But for now, I'm holding down the fort in our adult ministry area. And as Haley also said, I just finished my first year of seminary at Perkins School of Theology in hopes of becoming a Methodist elder in the future. So yes, so Reverend Stephanie Reed Meyer is down in traditional this morning. She has graciously given me this opportunity to come preach my first sermon with you all today. So history in the making, folks. Um, just kidding, but I am really excited to be here with you all. And I am going to be kicking off the new sermon series, Diving Deep. And we're going to look at the book of James, or the letter of James. And so today we're going to cover kind of like the... The who, what, why, where, how, why are we reading James, and how is this still relevant to us today? Because this is a letter that was written centuries, centuries ago, but we all know that we can still find amazing goodness and wisdom and truth in these ancient letters. So has anyone ever sent a letter, or maybe not a letter, but an email uh, to the wrong person or been on the receiving end of it when it wasn't actually you as the intended original audience. Um, yeah, me too. Lila, I don't think you have email yet. I am your mother, so I know this. But for, nor Nora, <laughs> but for those of you that have, I did this about a year and a half ago. I had applied to seminary. I had been accepted. I was excited but nervous and so I had only told a few people on staff that I was thinking about this crazy adventure. Um, if we haven't met yet, I have been married for 14 years to my wonderful husband Trent. We have two amazing daughters, Lila who is eight and Nora who is five and um, you know this felt a little later in life so how crazy would this be to go to seminary? So I told a few clergy but not very many but I was filling out my essays and scholarships one day because you need money to pay for seminary. And um, it asked, okay, we need the contact uh, to be able to tell us that you are a member of a local United Methodist Church. And I was like, no problem. I'll send it to our director of welcoming engagement, Lisa Booth. Lisa at cmc.com, submit. Oh, Lisa has no idea I'm going to seminary. Lisa's gonna be receiving an email about her communications director who wants a scholarship for Perkins. So I quickly pick up the phone and I'm like, Lisa, okay, confidential, but here's the whole rundown. Um, if you could just like keep, I'm not ready yet. She's like, that's so exciting. But Kristen, I don't, I don't have an email from them. And I'm like, you know, hit that send and receive. It's gotta be there. They're so fast about it. And she's like, who'd you, who'd you send this to? What does the email address say? And I was like, yeah, it says Lisa, L-I-S-A at cmc.com. And she's like, Kristen. And I knew before she said it, Oh my gosh, she is the only person on staff that her EML address is not first name at CUMC. I had sent it to the serving others director, Lisa Riazzi. So through a comedy of errors, I had to call her. And basically at that point, the whole church staff knew that I was attending seminary. But my point here is that sometimes we might receive or look at different things like a letter in the Bible that we weren't necessarily the original audience for. So it can be really helpful if we learn the background and the context to why this letter was first being sent to help it reveal some more truth for our own lives. So we're gonna kick off with the first chapter of James and I'm actually gonna take us into the salutation because salutations can tell us a lot about a letter. So we're looking at James 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greeting. So we really don't have a lot to go from because if you've read any of the other letters, Paul always says, you know, to the city of Corinth, to the city of, um, to the Philippians, to the Romans, this is to the 12 tribes in dispersion. There is no city of dispersion on the map. I looked it up. So 
we've got to do some scholarly work. And what's fantastic for me is that there's been a lot of other scholars who've done some great research. So I looked at one by J. Michael Walters, and he gives us a few different options, especially who this author is. Because it turns out there's almost as many James in the Bible as there are Marys. So it's not so easy to know who this author is at first. So we look at James, who was also known as James the Great. He was the son of Zebedee. He was also the brother of the beloved apostle John. So it's like, well, obviously, that makes sense. He was one of the inner circle of the disciples. However, scholars believe that this was written between late 40s to 60s AD, and um, this James the Great would have already passed. So that's pretty much impossible. So we go ahead and scratch him off the list. So the one that Walters argues is the James, he actually gets referred to as James the Just. They did some pretty cool names. I was uh, one of five Christians on my very first soccer team, and I just got called Kristen B for my last name. So I think it should have been more like Kristen the Wonderful, but um, I'm just going to put that out there for now. So we're going to go with James the Just. He was part, um, he was actually one of Jesus's half-brothers who was a little bit skeptical of Jesus's ministry at the beginning, which if you have a sibling, I think it's easy to understand skepticism when your brother tells you he's the son of God. Um, but by the time that we get to Pentecost, which if you were here last week with Stephanie, you'll know that James the Just was part of that circle. He was part of the early church leaders. He was actually the leader of the Jerusalem church, and he was leading the Jewish Christians there. So we're going to go with James the Just. If Stephanie says otherwise next week, just nod and say, that's who I went with too. Um, and don't tell her there's a recording of this. And so now we've got to know who is James the Just writing to. We know it's during the early church period of time, but who is receiving this letter? Well, 12 tribes in dispersion, as we already talked about, not a super helpful tip. But what we do know is since he's writing to Jewish Christians, they would have been very much knowledgeable, just like Jesus was, of the Old Testament. And so the 12 tribes is actually talking about the 12 tribes of Israel, the Israelites. And dispersion will talk about the time when the Israelites were ex exiled um, for, by Babylon. So then they were physically dispersed, they were physically separated. And James's problem isn't that the people his community is writing to that are being physically separated, but it's that they're spiritually separated. So James's letter, when we read it, it's going to talk more about how um, to have that wisdom to bring you back to an authentic faith. He's going to talk about how there's true religion and then there's inauthentic religion. You can go through the motions, but ha as, um, you know, Mason talked about how God transforms us and changes us, and you see that in outward ways. So while I could read the whole first chapter, I know y'all didn't just come for a dramatic reading, we're going to dive into just a few verses of James today. We're going to look at James 1, 17 through 27. Listen, friends, for the word of God. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourself of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look into a mirror, for they look at themselves, and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, being not haters, hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress 
and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let the church say. So I think you can already hear some of that wisdom just in those few verses of what James is trying to tell this community. But words that we can also take in for ourselves. I mean, think about it. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. So I thought immediately this should be embroidered on a throw pillow. So I couldn't find it on a throw pillow, but Etsy does have almost everything. So I found it on a shirt. So um, I think that other people besides me can feel the relevance of this wisdom that James is passing on today. And if we are slower to speak and quicker to hear, how much more can we hear from each other and our, from our neighbors? I also love the part about the mirror. Because if for me, I think about it as I'm coming here to church in this community, and I'm here looking at a mirror of who I want to be. I'm looking at my values. I'm looking at how I want to care for the orphans and the widows and my neighbors. And when I'm in this building, it is easy for me to say yes. It is harder when I go out of these walls into a world that maybe isn't as friendly to continue to know who I am or who I saw in that mirror. I thought an interesting fact was that Martin Luther, who was the um, start, really helped start the Protestant Reformation, wasn't sure he wanted to include this letter in the Bible, which is always interesting to hear. He was very concerned about the focus on faith by works and thought that all of James' talk about being doers and not hearers of the word, too much focus on us earning God's love. But that's not what I hear in James. What I hear from James is that if God's love has truly transformed us, those perfect gifts from above, that grace and mercy, then we can't help but go out into that world with our love. It reminds me of a hymn I loved as a kid. They'll know we're Christians by our love. If you don't know it, that's really the main point of it. They'll know we're Christians by our love. And I thought, how do we be doers of our faith? And it is by our love. For if we look at what Jesus commanded us, if we turn to Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, what is the great commandment? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So I think that the way that we can be doers of our faith is to love. And what's one of the best ways we can love each other and love our neighbors? <laughs> Lila has an answer for me. <laughs> I was going to say by kindness. Kindness is a wonderful way to show your love to your neighbor. So one of my favorite quotes that I found on the internet was throw kindness around like confetti. For you kids, you might have this already up, but if you think about it, think how confetti goes. When you throw it up in the air, it goes everywhere. It doesn't just land on like your best friends or your family, but you're throwing the pieces all across anyone you come to. And wouldn't that be wonderful if we left today and threw kindness around like confetti? I mean, and moms, dads, y'all know confetti, glitter gets stuck in everything. So you're gonna have kindness stuck to you for weeks, days, years. You're going to be vacuuming it under the couch later. But I think if we all lived like that, then that would be transformational. And they talked about small acts of kindness. And I think those are so amazing because really I want to say they're not small acts because they have such a huge impact. I mean, ask the kid on the playground who hasn't had a friend to play with when a group of kids come over and they invite him to join them a game of tag. Does that feel like a small act for him? Or what about the new mom on an airplane who's rocking a fussy baby that just can't stop and her neighbor offers some respite for her? Does that feel like a small act to that mom? Or the new neighbor that moves in on your street and they receive a welcoming basket and an invitation to dinner? I would also say that wouldn't feel like a small act to her. My oldest Lila went to Cub Scout camp this week and had a great time. On the last day, they were to bring um, an egg drop 
in. If y'all haven't heard, they're supposed to bring a contraption where you put an egg inside and then they drop it from really high and it's not supposed to crack. So her and my husband Trent worked really hard to figure this out because in Cub Scouts, loops are really easy to earn. But this egg drop, if it didn't crack, this was gonna be a badge. So this was a big deal. So they stayed up, they wrote down what their plan was, they looked at YouTube videos, y'all, it's crazy what you can find now. And so they decided on their plan and they put it together. What it involved, you'll have to ask him, I'm just support team. So then Thursday morning, all of the kids are bringing in their egg drops for Cub Scout camp. And we're at Bob Woodruff Park, if you know that, and we're walking down from the parking lot about three, five minutes to the shaded area where you check in your kids. And Lila's proudly holding hers. It's in a box. It's got like blue painter's tape and a couple of straws around it. And I'm walking next to her and another dad with a couple of kids are right next to us. They're bebopping around too. And then a little girl about Lila's age is also in a Cub Scout camp uniform. And her brother walks by and sees Lila's design and says, oh, that's a really bad design. And you can see Lila just kind of like, oh, it's kind of a bummer. And then he goes over and says it to his sister. And I was like, okay, don't mama bear a six-year-old. Like, it's gonna be okay. And luckily I didn't have to because as it turns out, this eight-year-old looks over at Lila and says, you did a really wonderful job on your design. That looks great. And I thought, wow, she didn't have to say that. She didn't know Lila. And Lila's confidence immediately went back up because it was a big deal. And it turned out this girl's day, it was her first time too at camp. So I think she understood what Lila was going to, through as well. So I just thought, wow, if kids can do this, I think adults can do this too. So today I'm gonna to conclude us with a poem called Small Kindnesses by Danusha Lamiris. And it talks about small kindnesses as the holy dwelling place. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by, or how strangers still say, bless you, when someone sneezes. A leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our, coffee, our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it, to smile at them and for them to smile back, for the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder, and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now so far, from tribe and fire, only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling place of the holy, these fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. Amen.